Glenn Lowry here. This is the Glenn Show. We're the Black Guys at Blogging Hits TV. Okay, we're underway. Uh, welcome, Jason. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. And John, good morning. Good morning. Glenn Lowry here, the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv and at glennlowry.substack.com. Uh, I'm with my conversation partner, John McWhorter. Every other week, Glenn and John, the Black Guys at bloggingheads.tv, hold forth here. Uh, and our, our special guest today is Jason Riley, who writes for the Wall Street Journal and is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the author of uh, a new book, Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell, published by Basic Books. And we're going to talk to Jason about his biography of Thomas Sowell. So excited to be doing that with you this morning, Jason. Uh, I'm excited to be here uh, with both of you guys. You know, um, I've been following your work for, uh, for a long, long time and I've learned a lot about it. And uh, 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 so I'm a little intimidated, but happy to be here. <laughs> well, Jason. Yeah, Jason, ahead, can I ask John. you a quick question? Sure. Tom Sowell, A Magnificent Life. But tell me, in terms of where the conversation with a capital C is today, especially today, would you say that his is a story of victory, a story of failure, or something in between? Where do you place a soul. So, for example, to make a very facile comparison, and I'm not, I, this is not a leading question. I just, this is a real question. Schuyler, George Schuyler, if you kind of look at his trajectory, how it went, in a way, you feel like it didn't work. He kind of passed away in ignominy, basically. And some of us today read him and we think, hey, wait a minute. But at the time, he just went. Mm -hmm. How would you situate Sowell's? contribution, which I think is larger than Schuyler's, but still, in terms of that perspective. Well, I don't think the story's over yet, John. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, I'd like to see more people out there uh, thinking like Sol and uh, with a larger appreciation of his, of his scholarship, certainly. Uh, I'd like to see more than there are. Um, but there are more than there were. Um, I, I think he has had an impact. Um, I hope so. He's, um, uh, you know, he's been skeptical. First of all, you, you mentioned Schuyler, and, and, and I think your, your characterization of Schuyler is largely right. He, um, um, you know, he, he had a run there from the 1920s to around the 1960s. And, and uh, in my research for the Soul book, Schuyler's name came up quite a bit, uh, including in, in, in talking to Tom. Um, uh, but I do think that, that Soul's legacy is, is far larger than Schuyler's. I mean, he, he, he did pretty much die in obscurity um, and was known largely for writings on race. Uh, most of Sol's scholarship um, does not concern racial, racial themes. Most of his books are not about race. He's a, he's, a, he's a social theorist, he's an economic historian, he's a political philosopher, uh, and he's weighed in on, on racial and cultural issues. Um, so Sol has a, a huge body of work that with, with, with a range far wider than Schuyler's. And I think, um, I frankly think that, that even if Tom had never written a single word about affirmative action, um, he's left a, a legacy uh, that, that we, we, we people will be talking about um, long after, long after he's gone in those other, in those other areas. Um, uh, one thing I, I, I recall from, uh, your most recent book, uh, Woke Racism, which I read recently, is how hard it is to name uh, American Blacks who have written nonfiction books on topics other than race. You know, you've done it, Soul's done it. My first book was on, was on immigration. Um, but it is surprisingly hard to, to come up with a lot of names. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty short list. But Soul has done that in spades. I mean, he, this is a guy who's written around 40 books, most of which, as I said, are not, are not about race. So, um, um, uh, but, but I, so on, on the one hand, I, I am uh, disappointed that there aren't more people out there who, uh, who, who think like Tom, but at the same time, I think um, um, there are, I have some hope that, that uh, some people are coming along. Some of the people you, you've had on this show, you know, your, 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 your Coleman Hughes's, your Wilford Riley's, um, 
uh, as a Jason Hill uh, philosopher uh, at DePaul University. Um, there, there is a, a sort of younger generation out there, I think, that has picked up on a lot of things that Tom has, has said over the years. I don't know if they'll stay the course. As you know, it's a tough, tough <laughs> road <laughs> to hoe, but, um, but I, am give, I, I, I do have some hope. Uh, some hope. Uh, I, can, I can also talk about where I'm disappointed, but maybe we'll, we'll get into that a little later. <laughs> Well, let's let's expand a little bit on on your basic point right there, which is that soul is a large intellectual figure in our time, that he's a social theorist and a moral philosopher, as, as well as uh, a chronicler of African-American economic status. Uh, so what's the case for Thomas Sowell uh, uh, entering the Pantheon as one of the great social scientists of the last part of the 20th, uh, first part of the 21st century? Well, I, I think he's been right about a lot of things. Um, you have to re remember how, how old Tom is. He's, uh, he turned 91 years old last month. Um, a man born in 1930 uh, and uh, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, orphaned. Uh, as, as a child, um, taken in by a great aunt, moves the family north to Harlem, where he's raised. Um, uh, you know, had a rather tumultuous home life, but was a, a smart kid, but ended up dropping out of, out of, out of high school and, and, and leaving home at the age of 17. Uh, spent a decade sort of just wandering around trying to do any kind of menial job that would have him. Um, gets drafted into the Marines during the Korean War, uh, sort of starts to uh, uh, turn his life around uh, in the military, um, attends uh, Howard University on the GI Bill, spends a year there, then transfers to Harvard, then on to Columbia, the University of Chicago, and um, spends a, a, a decade teaching in the, in the academy, the 60s. Um, uh, I think, doesn't like the way things are going in the academy. I think he set out to be a teacher. I think Tom would have loved to have lived his life teaching economics, teaching too, not researching, teaching. He liked the classroom. But um, a lot of things were going on in the 1960s with the women's movement and the gay rights movement and the anti-war movement and, and so forth. And um, uh, standards were becoming more lax. I think Tom wanted to teach the way he had been taught that was harder and harder to do in the 1960s. Uh, eventually gets fed up and starts to sort of drift away from teaching in the 1970s, eventually goes off to, to Hoover in 1980 and um, uh, starts writing these, these uh, book after book after book in plain English for uh, general interest audiences. I think that's something he picked up from one of his mentors at the University of Chicago, Milton Friedman, who after leaving teaching went off and, and, and made a, a point of addressing non-academics, speaking to general audiences about economics, um, being sort of a popularizer. He thought the role of a scholar is not simply to talk to your, to your peers in the academy, but to explain your discipline to people that uh, may know nothing about it. And I think Thomas spent a lifetime doing that uh, in book after book and in column after column. When he, when he retired his column back in 2016, I said, a lot of people probably just lost the best professor they ever had, even if they never went to college because Tom has spent so much of his career um, uh, explaining these concepts, whether it's in economics, uh, whether it's in sociology or demography or what have you, uh, uh, to non-experts. And, and I think that will, that will largely be, be his legacy. And, and he's just been, uh, made his mark in so many different areas. Uh, I think he's, he's, he's worry, you know, worthy of, of, of being in that, in that pantheon of great thinkers, and not just great black thinkers, Glenn. I think um, uh, Soul is is someone who who um, um, I think it's a disservice to call him one of the great black thinkers, because I think that um, his contributions, intellectual contributions, uh, transcend uh, race, and and uh, he's uh, been as or more prolific uh, than than uh, almost any intellectual of his generation. Um, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't sell them short that way. Uh, I'm going to push back a little bit just with this. Can you be a popularizer who writes in tones that are accessible, terms that are accessible 
to the general public, an educator of the masses, as it were, and also be a great scientist in whatever your specialization is. I mean, Carl Sagan comes to mind, an astronomer uh, who became famous with public television shows about the cosmos, uh, but who uh, was never on the short list for a Nobel Prize because he didn't actually do the frontier advancing scientific work of his discipline. Uh, so it, I, I detect a bit of a tension between Seoul as a columnist for Forbes magazine or a person who writes books that anyone can read on the one hand, and Seoul as a, as a great intellectual advancing the science of economics on the other. Uh, Milton Friedman, of course, had established his bona fides as a fundamental contributor to basic economic theory with a, a vast a body of work in monetary theory and uh, macroeconomics and so on before he wrote uh, Free to Choose or uh, whatever else he might have done uh, in terms of uh, addressing the, uh, the general uh, public conversation. So it's a serious question. Uh, Tom Sowell on the short list for a Nobel Prize seems like a long shot to me because the economics profession will be looking around for exactly what the nature of his fundamental contributions to economics have been. Well, uh, two points. Uh, one, I agree there is a trade-off. Um, uh, and, and I think your, your assessment of Friedman's career is, is correct. Um, Sol did write um, books for other intellectuals uh, and, and distinguished himself in writing those books. So in, in the 1960s, he wrote all, almost exclusively about economic history, which is his, his, his discipline. Um, writing about you know Say's Law and, and and writing about Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and David Ricardo and and, and those guys and um, uh, uh, so he's he's written those books. Uh, he wrote an economics textbook in the nineteen sixties. Um, um, so uh, there 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 is a trade off. He could have continued down that road, and many people urged him to. Frankly. Um, he, he turned to writing about these racial controversies, he says, out of a sense of duty, that there were things that needed to be said and there were too few other people willing, willing to say them. He, he didn't like the direction of the civil rights movement uh, uh, in the late 60s and on into the 70s and, and uh, thought they were barking up the wrong tree in terms of how to help the black poor. And, and he spoke out against that. I would argue, Glenn, that um, if, if anything uh, has cost Tom, um, it's that decision to weigh in on racial controversies, which means that his other work does not get the fair shake that it should. I, I think that, um, I mean, we use the term cancel today, but Tom was canceled a long time ago uh, because of he weighed in on, 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 on racial controversies with, with, with views uh, opposing affirmative action, a lot of government uh, welfare programs and so forth. And the, 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 the people who, uh, you know, uh, hand out the awards um, in academic circles, uh, the people in the media, um, uh, by and large, you're talking about people on the left. And he has refused to pull his punches. He has refused to play footsie with them. And I think that has cost him, um, not only in terms of notoriety, it's one reason why more people know who, who Nicole Hannah-Jones and Ibram Kendi and Ta-Nehisi Coates are than know who Tom Sowell is. So it's cost him not only in terms of notoriety, I think it's cost him professionally in terms of being considered for some of these uh, awards that he might otherwise have been considered for. Oh, I think that's certainly true. Um, I can testify from my own personal experience as a graduate student in the 1970s studying economics and then as a young assistant professor interested in racial inequality. And Tom was dropping these uh, uh, bombs, you know, I mean, of these articles that he was publishing, for example, about black education and, and so on, or about the fact that uh, the black white uh, disparities closed more uh, before the civil rights movement than after the civil rights movement, stuff of this kind. And some of my professors, white professors uh, at MIT, uh, coming across this stuff brought it to my attention and, and said, you know, you ought, to, you ought to take this into account. You ought to, you know, what's this guy up to? You ought to, be, you know, see what his work is doing. That was uh, mid-1970s. By the time you get to the early 1980s and Tom has come out and, you know, supported Ronald Reagan and uh, has, uh, uh, it, you know, been making even uh, more uh, effective interventions in the, in the discussion from a, from a right of center point of view, uh, any kind of endorsement of Thomas Sowell was an anathema 
yeah. and, and people just kind of backed away from it. You had to choose sides, uh, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, and, and I should add, uh, when I say that he's become a popularizer, um, or, or in some of his books, uh, that's what he's doing. Um, I, I don't mean to d- diminish the quality of these books. I mean, um, books like Knowledge and Decisions, which is a book about social theory, uh, Hayekian social theory, um, which was praised to high heavens by Hayek himself. Tom was not just a fan of Hayek's work. He was an actual student of Friedrich Hayek in the early 1960s at the University of Chicago. Um, and after his, his book, um, uh, Knowledge and Decisions was published in 1980, um, uh, Hayek wrote a review of it and said that this guy, Saul, has taken his thinking uh, on some of these concepts and directions that Hayek said, I myself didn't even realize it could be taken. I mean, so Hayek was, people like James Buchanan came out and said, I wish I'd written this book. Uh, this book <laughs> needed to be written. This is brilliant stuff. This is original stuff. Another book like A Conflict of Visions is a serious book. It's readable, just like Knowledge and Decisions is. But this is heavy stuff. I mean, this is political philosophy. This is tracing you know, the, the origins of our conflicts about politics and social issues, uh, trying to explain where they come out of historically, going all the way back to readers like Godwin and Rousseau and Burke, all the way through John Rawls and so forth. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not, you know, light reading, Glenn. This is, these are serious issues that he's tackled, albeit in a way that makes them accessible to more people. Um, but um, uh, I just wanted to put that out there when I say that Saul has a reputation as a popularizer. It's not a, a term of derision. What people don't always know is that um, if you devote yourself to being a popularizer to a certain extent, you're not taking the easy road. And I have never heard anybody say to me as a linguist popularizer that the popularizing isn't real work. So I'm not saying this out of some sort of peak. If anybody says that about me and they they must, they've never said it to me. I, I get nothing but respect to my face. But I think a lot of people who think, well, popularizing isn't as hard as doing the real thing, haven't tried to popularize. It isn't just that you take away the detail and write stuff down. A lot of people who think, well, you know, I could sit down and write a book in plain English, you know, explaining only what the ordinary person can understand, but I choose to do the real thing and write in tapeworm sentences and write with exquisite detail, et cetera. A lot of those people, I very humbly say, if you had to sit down with metaphorically a blank piece of paper Mm -hmm. and you were going to write about what you do, and this is the thing, decide what you're going to put in terms of what the layman can understand, which is going to be a subtraction of what you're going to share with, you know, 55 specialists, but then not only write down what the layman can understand, but make it so that the layman will actually read it. It's one thing to put it on paper, but come up with a book that more than two people are going to read. And then tell me that I'm just a popularizer and that I'm doing the easy thing, because frankly, not everybody can do that. And I know there's some very, noble popular linguistics books written by very smart and very nice people where I must admit somewhere towards the middle, I find places where I think the reason that this book hasn't gotten around is because this person doesn't happen to have that particular knack. I remember one, I'm not going to mention it where he gets to a concept that is a little hard. You can get it across to people, but frankly, you have to know how, but he says, get some coffee. This is hard. And I thought, no, you don't tell them to get some coffee. You figure out how to get it across to them without them drinking any damn coffee, that sort of thing. (laughs) But it means that you have to work at it. And so with Tom, it's hard work what he's done, especially when you can read it as an ordinary person, I think. Yeah, you're you're, you're right, John. And I would just add, um, uh, he's an academic who can write. And he writes as clearly as he thinks. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, there are a lot of smart people out there who just can't write. (laughs) <laughs> and Tom, Tom can write and, and, and it's a gift, you know, it, it's something he worked at as well, but it's, it's something that is, is rather rare among, um, among academics and among intellectuals and Tom, Tom can do it. But your point about um, the difficulty of being a popularizer is something Tom has also written about. So Tom's first book was an economics textbook for college undergraduates that was published in 1970. And I should note the year there because um, 
for someone who's been so prolific, it's amazing what a late start Tom got. Jason, is that basic it. economics? No, no, Just no. interrupting briefly. No, no, no. Before this, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. he wrote, I'll, I'll get to basic economics, but he wrote an economics textbook uh, called, I believe it's called Economics Issues and Analysis. And it's for undergraduate college students, um, uh, full of charts and graphs about the elasticity of demand and all that just as, as you would see in any undergraduate textbook. And uh, Tom, again, this comes out in 1970, it's his first book. Tom was 40 years old before he published his first book. You think about how prolific he's been, given what a late start he got. So that was one point I want to make. But the second point is that Tom has said, um, so he wrote that economics textbook. And then later he said about writing basic economics which is his most popular book. It sold more copies than any of his other books, been translated into a half dozen different languages and so forth. And um, Tom said that writing that second book, Basic Economics, which is essentially an economics textbook without any graphs and charts and, 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 uh, you know, uh, and, and so forth, he says was much, much harder than writing the first one. The first one he wrote, I think in a summer, <laughs> the second one, <laughs> it took something <laughs> like 10 years. So he's done both. And he's and yeah. he and he is and he has written about the difficulty of, of, of uh, the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got to object here, guys. I mean, I think it's a great value in service to write an economics book without graphs and charts that can get some of the fundamental ideas about there ain't no free lunch. Uh, across to a person who's never going to uh, uh, do a graph or, or read a chart. So I credit that. That's a, that's a plus. That's a contribution. A lot is lost when you leave out the graphs and the charts. The graphs and the charts are not just obscurantism. They're, they're not just a full employment act for uh, mathematically inclined, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, there's a lot of information that you get out of the graphs and the charts that deepens and amplifies the insights that you get from a 30,000 foot. So I, I think you can, you can do both. There's absolutely nothing wrong with popularization and there's nothing wrong with conveying the basic insights sure. of a discipline to the masses of people. But the way that the discipline advances is through the work that goes on on the frontier. And you're not, you're not going to understand that without graphs and charts. So I, 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 I agree. I think we're talking past one another a little yeah, bit here, okay. Glenn. I mean, I, mean yeah. that, 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 I think what you said is absolutely true. I will say that Tom's desire to write an economics textbook without graphs and charts um, is, is, uh, is, is worth noting. And, and, and I think it goes back to... Uh, uh, where he learned economics, University of Chicago, this, this famous Chicago school, which went about teaching uh, economics uh, in a way, um, in, in many ways different from your MITs, your Harvards, um, uh, where graphs and, and theory and charts were, uh, it was, I mean, this is what economics was about, elegant theories. Uh, Friedman has written about this, the, the, the distinction between what was going on in Chicago with its focus on, on a more empirical approach and, 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 and the usefulness of economics in solving everyday problems versus it being some math, math, uh, you know, math exercise and theoretical exercise, the way it was taught at other schools. Tom comes out of that Chicago tradition. And I think his, and his I come desire- out of that, And I come out of that Paul Samuelson, MIT yes, tradition. Yes, and so I think part of, part of Tom's, uh, uh, the reason he wanted to, 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 do, to do this was I think, I think linked in some way to that Chicago school tradition. Let's talk about the books. Why is conflict of visions important? What's the argument well, and why is it important? Well, the, 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 the argument is, is um, that, uh, as I was saying before, that, that a lot of our political disputes and, 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 and uh, over you know, social issues and so forth, Tom argues comes out of uh, two uh, fundamentally different ways of how the world works. And um, the two visions he described um, are the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision. And the constrained vision is a view of, of, of human nature that says there are um, sort of limits to human betterment. He also calls it the tragic vision, this constrained vision, that um, you know, we, we, we may want to 
uh, solve poverty or get rid of racism or get rid of war, but that's not likely to, to happen. And so the best we can do is to set up uh, you know, institutions and, and processes that help us deal with problems uh, that we're probably never going to solve entirely. So we may wanna eliminate crime, but that's probably not gonna happen. So you need a, a rule of law and you need a court system to adjudicate uh, various disputes that people will inevitably have. You may wanna get, get, get rid of war uh, uh, and, 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 and have world peace, but again, that's probably not gonna happen. So you do need a military defense uh, to, to, to deal with, with, what might, with, with what might arise. And he contrasts this, this, this vision of the world with what he calls this unconstrained or more utopian vision that says, no, um, we, we can not only manage these problems, we can solve them. We can eliminate poverty and racism. It's just a matter of, of reason and willpower. And moreover, there will be no trade-offs in doing so. Um, uh, and, 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 and Sol says, depending on which of these views you hold, it's going to tell us a lot about where you come down on anything from uh, you know, defense spending to, to tax rates to rent control to uh, a, a lot can be learned about someone's thinking and that it is a logical extension of, of this ultimate view of the world that they have. And, and, and he traces this thinking, um, as I said earlier, back to writers in the like late 1700s, like uh, William Godwin and, um, and, and on through Burke and, and, and Adam Smith and, and on down through John Rawls. And, um, uh, and I think it, we're still having these disputes today. Uh, this is what the social justice uh, movements have, have always been about, this sort of more utopian view of, of us being able to solve problems versus others who think um, um, that's wishful thinking. Uh, these, these problems will never be entirely solved or eliminated. That's a conservative vision, though. Um, I, would, I would call it a, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, if you're gonna, uh, in, the, in the crudest terms possible, you could call it a conservative vision. Um, uh, I mean, uh, one yeah. side of me reacts as an economist, no free lunch, opportunity costs, and I get it, I get it completely. Resources are limited, choices have to be made. There are constraints. You can wish that the constraints weren't there, but the constraints are nevertheless going to be there. And if you try to uh, act as if they aren't there, those costs are going to be borne someplace else in the system. And we could go found minimum wage, rent control, uh, things of this kind. Um, the utopian vision is also a hopeful vision, and it's a it's a it's a moral vision. So, uh, are these people uh, who embrace the um, unconstrained uh, vision uh, uh, fools to want to make a better world? Uh, to no, to, no, to want to try to appeal to their fellow citizens to to you know rise to a higher you know to care about the poor to be disturbed by homelessness. No, uh, but they're not, they're not fools, Glenn. And, and in fact, the, the a Conflict of Visions is part of an informal trilogy that Saul wrote. Uh, the second book in the trilogy is called uh, The Vision of the Anointed. And, and the second uh, and the third is called um, The Quest for Cosmic Justice. And in the second and third book, Saul sort of gets into uh, critiques of the various visions, of the two visions. Um, in the first book, he's really just laying this out. And, and uh, two things. One of the reasons it's, I think, it's his favorite of all his books, A Conflict of Visions. He, and a lot of others agree, uh, along with Knowledge and Decisions, that those are probably his two best books. Um, but, but the reason The Conflict of Visions is, is so important, if you want to get inside Soul's head, is because it is through this framework that he's writing about everything that he writes about, whether it's race, whether it's immigration, whether it's culture, whether it's economic history. Tom uh, believes uh, in that uh, you know, more limited uh, view of, of, of the betterment of humanity, um, that tragic view he accepts, that constrained view he accepts. And so where you want, if you wanna understand where Tom is coming from on almost anything he's writing about, uh, a conflict of visions is the book to read, but in the in those latter two, um, because he does get into more critiques of the visions themselves, the latter two books are a little more tendentious. 
but it's not in the sense of, 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 of calling people with an unconstrained vision fools. It's, it's pointing out why this is unrealistic um, and, and what the track record of this thinking, um, where it gets you. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, the, 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 the whole social justice movement, if you, if you or, or the, the, the sort of um, the, the critical race theorist, um, if you nail down someone like, like a Kendi and say, okay, give me, you know, when will you be satisfied that, that um, uh, enough people are anti-racist or uh, that racism is no, long, no longer a problem or uh, uh, that we've, 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 we've arrived at where you want us to be as a society? He will point to um, no more disparities in outcomes. Now, if you're Tom Sowell or someone else who has studied <laughs> societies down through history, not here in, only here in America, but around the world, you will, you will understand that there has never been a society where group disparities did not exist. It's an entirely utopian view, which means Kenny will never be satisfied. <laughs> or what it means <laughs> is that, and I'm sorry, I'm fighting with, a lawnmower who will not go away and I can't get away from him. Sorry about the noise. But um, the issue is that if you put that kind of question to people with that kind of ideology in a better American discourse, they would realize that it's upon them to explain how you would have this complete absence of disparities, despite the realities that somebody like Seoul has put forth. And so the idea is that people like that would realize just how radical they are. And really, maybe some of them could come up with some strategy. They could say, yes, that is the way things look. It looks like there isn't a free lunch, but here is my construct where I think that we should look towards this kind of vision rather than the more conservative one. Instead, we have a debate where books like Sowell's, that trilogy should be key reading. It should be, you know, like the Bible. But instead, a certain kind of person thinks that the quote unquote liberal version is the only way to think and that there could never be any coherent or moral argument against it. That's what the culture ends up missing in ignoring the teachings of somebody like Sowell. So, so Kendi approaches the world as if equal outcomes are the norm. Um, and where we don't have them, something nefarious is going on. And Sol says, no, <laughs> we don't see equal outcomes anywhere. They are the natural state of things. That is the constrained view. We can work towards making things more equal. And there are things we can do to try and address these disparities. But we should know that no society ever has produced them anywhere at any time uh, but, so, so so those are the yeah. constraints we should be thinking with uh, hold on jason i mean if you had said uh, john stewart mill has a essay on the liberation of women i forget exactly what it what it's called but he basically it's like 1860 or something like that and he argues against the suppression of women and uh this is an earlier time in 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 uh the history of Western culture. And um, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that women should be treated as equal, that they should have the suffrage, that they shouldn't uh, be under the suzerainty of their husband's uh, will, uh, that they were persons in and of themselves. Uh, you could have easily defended the suppression of women, the withholding of the ballot, uh, their limitations of their property rights or their access to their children or whatever, you could easily defend it on the argument that there's not a society anywhere on the planet where women are, are equal to men. This is a natural order of things. It can't possibly be an argument, can it, against uh, a, a claim to reform. No, uh, no. Now, that, that's... But now, now, that's a theoretical observation because I completely agree with the point in, in hand. And, and in fact, would, no, but... argue, would argue that it's internally inconsistent to, uh, to seek uh, uh, a lack of any disparities between groups, because if the groups have any content in and of themselves, any dimensions of culture or uh, uh, a belief that makes them groups, that makes Jews different from Armenians, different from you know, uh, European Catholics, different from, uh, you know, uh, then of course that's going to express itself in the way in which people develop their uh, poten human potential and specialize their division of labor. And so we're not going to see 
equal number of groups in every human endeavor if the groups have any meaning at all. Sure. And, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, no one would argue, uh, no one would have argued uh, 200 years ago that because, um, I mean, someone might have argued, but we would have thought it was a ridiculous argument like your women's argument, that uh, because slavery has existed in all societies down through history, we should continue having slavery. That's the argument for slavery. It's always existed, so we should continue. No, no one, no one, no one. That that's not the argument to make, and and I and I think that's that that'd be kind of a perversion, I think, of what 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 Soul is saying, like the woman's argument that 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 you used. But um, uh, Soul has also argued that these. My, my, well, the, the the point is that Glenn, when when you start, when you start from the premise that equal outcomes are the norm. And that where you don't see them, um, some outside forces to blame, it can lead you down all kinds of, uh, you know, box canning. I mean, it just it, it, you 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 start to you 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 look at the SAT test and you go, well, um, uh, you know, Asians score this, black score this, Hispanics score this, uh, you know, obviously there's something wrong with this test um, because. Uh, if there wasn't something wrong with this test, we would get. Then everybody would do equally. Yeah, right? everyone would do equally. Yeah. No, this, this, there's just all kinds of logical fallacies going into that assumption. But that's where that thinking gets you, and that's that's mm -hmm. you know writ large what a lot of the I think the social justice movement is about. It, it is looking at outcomes and then saying uh, uh, we don't see proportionality or anything close to it, and therefore. Something must be wrong, and 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 Tom's point is just simply that you don't find this proportionality that they say is the norm anywhere, and yet it is held up as norm. And 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 what you find everywhere, which is disproportionality, is held up as something, um, um, uh, you know, that, that is that is, uh, you know, evidence of 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 third party nefarious behavior. Um, what these other people should be responsible for saying is disparity has been a norm up until now, and we propose that we could have a society without them. We know this is going to be a challenge. This is how we're going to do it. We would like to get beyond the way things are. And you could even say it used to be said that slavery was everywhere, that women were subjugated everywhere, and we got beyond that. Well, we have decided that we want to get beyond the natural process, which is disparity between groups. And there's no reason there wouldn't be disparities between descendants of African slaves and yeah. other people. The, the, but that's not the way it's phrased. It's right. phrased as if, as you say, Jason, there's this just nefariousness and that there's some human norm where everybody is equal that we don't have because of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining. Right. That's a highly right. oversimplified right. argument, and none of those people are ever called on it, nor do they know that there's an argument to be called upon about. And yeah, that, that's a flaw in the culture. But right the, the other the other thing that, that Thomas pointed out is that what what progressives in particular have done and progressives who hold this this unconstrained view of human nature um, is they've they've they, they find uh, a factor in, in uh, something that may produce uh, disparate outcomes and decide that it is the factor. So if you go back a hundred years, the progressives were, were convinced that it was, uh, you know, the eugenics movement, we get the eugenics movement. It's, it's, it's hereditary, it's genes that is producing different outcomes among groups. And, and that was the, the, the progressive mainstream opinion back then, it gets eugenics. That falls out of favor, um, hundred years later, the, the, the progressives and are convinced that it is discrimination that is producing uh, uh, disparate outcomes and, and, and full stop. No, nothing else can, be, can, can explain those differing SAT scores than, than discrimination on mm -hmm. the part of the test, on the part of the teacher, on the part of the system, blah, blah, blah. But it's discrimination and nothing else. And we can't talk about anything else. And, and, and so he, he has critiqued their, their glomming on to one factor and making it the factor and, and dismissing all other uh, uh, plausible explanations of what might be and going this, on. And this is what I wish had happened. I wish Tom were a little less old because <laughs> if Tom were maybe 20 years younger, he could be saying this on Bill Maher. You know, the thing is, Tom <laughs> wrote books, everything's on paper, and most human beings don't read nonfiction work. 
That's the problem. And notice I didn't say black people. Well, I said John, most uh, people, uh, let me just including observe. many academics. Uh, I wish that he but go ahead, Glenn, but I wish he had been able to do more of modern media because I think he would have been more widely heard. You should go Tom Soul at uh, YouTube uh, videos, man. Uh, there's a vast trove of interviews of him uh, at the Hoover Institution sitting across the table from somebody and reflects and they get many hundreds of thousands of views. Well, uh, good. Okay. Can, Am can I, I not can right? I, can I, Okay. Yeah, oh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And I did a I, I narrated a documentary film about Tom's life. And um, um, uh, we, we used material that was already out there, essentially. And there was plenty of it. And, and, and he's very popular on, on YouTube and on, on social media. In fact, there's a um, there. He has a fan account. Tom's not on Twitter, but he's got a fan account uh, that simply quotes uh, uh, bits from his books or columns doesn't add anything, just direct quotes, um, has more than 700,000 followers on, on Twitter, just that good. account. But can, good. Can I, I wanted to ask you, you two uh, a question, and, I, and I, your audience should know I interviewed you both for the book and, um, uh, uh, and, and might have asked you this during our, our interviews, but we, we started this by talking about why there aren't more um, Thomas Sowell's out there, and John had asked, you know, what what's his legacy in that regard? Um, I have two two a two part question. One is, I, I um, some people say um, they wish Tom had stayed in teaching, that, that he had stuck it out in academia, because then he would have uh, thousands of graduate students who had studied under him, you know, dissertations he had he had uh, overseen and so forth, and and maybe you would have. Uh, more uh, more Tom Soul types out there uh, if if he had done that um, and and I, I I don't think Tom had the temperament for it and again he tell you the trade off would be you know fewer books probably fewer newspaper columns certainly fewer popular books like the one he's uh, he's he's best known for and so forth so there would be it would be a trade off um, uh, but what I wanted to ask you about is there was a period in the late seventies and early eighties. When um, I won't say that there were more Thomas Souls coming along, because I think Tom is sui generis, and, but there were more black thinkers or a, a sort of a handful or so of black thinkers who were starting to challenge the civil rights orthodoxy. I'm talking about people like William Julius Wilson, declining significance of race. Orlando Patterson was saying some things. Uh, Randall Kennedy was saying some things. Uh, the, Glenn Lowry was saying some things. They were coming along. Uh, oh, Stephen Alks Carter, uh, the law professor at Yale. Stephen Carter was, was another one in this group. Um, what happened? to all of these people. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I don't like to psychoanalyze people. I don't like to be psychoanalyzed. My book does not psych psychoanalyze Tom, but, um, um, you know, maybe some of them uh, had a change of, of heart about how best to help Blacks. It just, they started to think differently about these things. Maybe some said their piece and they just wanted to go write and talk about other things. Uh, maybe some didn't like how they were being depicted in the media as too close to the political right and we're getting blowback. Um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think. I know all those circumstances are probably gonna be different. And, and, and also, did you notice the same pattern what, or, or is this in, just in my, in my head? Um, were, there, were there more black thinkers out there that seemed to be willing to, to challenge the the sort of liberal orthodoxy about how best to help blacks. And then they all sort of, sort, sort of not all, but the, many of them just sort of faded. You're talking about the people I was kind of minted on. And yeah, there was this bright shining moment and then all of a sudden they were gone. I think all three of them are different stories and pretty easy ones. Stephen Carter didn't want to be typed, doesn't want to be typed as just a black writer. He really clearly doesn't want it. He dealt with that with the first book, but then he wanted to write about faith. He wanted to write novels. He doesn't want to be typed, which I fully understand. You know, you can you get put into this little box. Kennedy, I think one doesn't particularly like being hated, but more importantly, has very middle of the road views. And I don't mean that as a criticism, but I think he really doesn't fit into any of these categories and he's not interested in pretending that he does. Wilson, frankly, I think, didn't have it in him to be hated. And I kind of watched how he started 
kowtowing to those who would cheer him on for talking about racism. I watched it during a bookstore talk for one of his books. I forget which one where he was clearly and it's very human. I could I could see where where this was coming from. But the audience was wary of him. They were trying to decide whether he was one of the bad guys or one of the good guys. And you could see him breathe freely when somebody would stand up and praise him for pointing out the role of racism as opposed to what they had gotten from his books 10 years before. And I thought, yeah, I get it. He just he doesn't want to be despised. You know, most people yeah, don't. Yeah. I think with the three of them, it was it was different. I don't know if there's any one narrative, but okay. yeah, all three of them are not. There are four, John. You left out Randall Kennedy. I have a different take. I know these people. I mentioned uh, them. But go ahead. But, yeah. Uh, William Julius Wilson is a democratic socialist sociologist. He's a man of the left. Uh, he has, he has uh, deep political commitments. He believes in the European style welfare state. Um, you know, his books are, uh, and, and he's a towering figure. Uh, William Julius Wilson is someone who, who did uh, create an army of graduate students. His it ripples of his influence of his, intellectual children and grandchildren throughout the sociology profession are, are quite profound. That urban poverty and family life study that he oversaw at the University of Chicago that led to the publication of When Work Disappears uh, had uh, dozens, maybe even scores of, I was at his retirement party at Harvard and some of these people showed up. I was surprised at how many influential sociologists had gone through that hmm. shop. Uh, so he, you know, he fancies himself, uh, Bill Wilson does, I think, as you know, uh, the E. Franklin Frazier or somebody like that of his generation, a, an African-American sociologist left of center uh, who's uh, spent a career chronicling and producing data about extreme poverty uh, and uh, the structure of, a, you know, the declining significance of race was really a Marxian text. If, if you look at the declining significance of race, what Wilson argues in that book, which is read as a counter, as you just did, Jason, as a counter to the civil rights establishment. What he argues in that book is that the structure of production in terms of race will affect the expression of political uh, uh, dynamics in terms of race. So he has three epochs, uh, the, the slavery epoch, the, the postbellum uh, pre-industrial effort, and then the post-industrial epoch. And he claims that the black-white dynamic is mainly driven by the economic structure, which is a, a very Marxian uh, kind of uh, way of looking at the world. And at his retirement party, when I made this observation, he laughed because uh, you know I, I, he, he knew that I was uh, putting my finger on something. Orlando Patterson, he started out as a novelist, by the way, Orlando Patterson, before he became a sociologist. Uh, he's... Uh, uh, also a man of the left. He was uh, Michael Manley, the socialist government in Jamaica. Uh, Patterson was very close to him and whatnot. Uh, slavery and social death. Yes, he's talking about culture. Patterson is, you know, a, a relative conservative in the, the argument amongst African-American intellectuals about inequality and in culture. He thinks culture is important. Uh, but uh, he, he's mainly a, a historical sociologist. He, he writes these huge books. His book, Freedom, won a National Book Award, Freedom in the History of Western Culture. The, the intellectual ambition of uh, slavery and social death is monumental. I mean, he undertakes to survey the institution of slavery on five continents over two millennia. Uh, it's not just about African slavery in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I, I put Bill Wilson, sociologist, uh, one of the important sociologists of the second half of the 20th century, an Orlando Patterson sociologist, in a category all by themselves, and in a Sowellian manner, I would say they happen to have been writing about race, but the value of their contribution is really a, is a, is a, 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 to the discipline of sociology altogether is very significant. Well, Carter, Carter yeah, and, and uh, uh, Kennedy, Kennedy are, are lawyers, uh, I, I think I will agree with you, John, that Randy doesn't want to be on the bad end of a piece in Slate or, uh, you know, uh, the Atlantic or whatever, which uh, associates him with, uh, with conservative. I think he's cutting, you know, he's doing his calculations. He's trying to figure out the political angles. 
But I, I think he also has a part with him that just won't bear nonsense, won't won't put up with silliness. And so he will, you know, he will call it out. He was an early critic of critical race theory, for example. He wrote yes. this yeah. infamous article in the Harvard Law Review where he called out Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia mm -hmm. Williams for thinking that they could do legal analysis by autobiographic storytelling, yeah. which he thought was silly and was a dodge away from the hard problem of trying to do legal analysis, which is enough mm -hmm. unto itself. Yeah. Uh, but, well, uh, well, well when, I, when I asked John about this, when I interviewed him for, for Tom, I, if I recall, John, you made the observation. One other person made the same observation, which was I interviewed Charles Murray uh, for the book about Tom, um, and um, he made the same observation. And it was that all these guys we're talking about um, are, are uh, academics, and um, they, they probably wanted to remain academics. And it's very tough to um, say these things uh, that got them labeled for that brief period of time, conservative, uh, and remain in good standing in the faculty lounge. And John, remember, I remember saying, you know, you want to be part of the social fabric of, um, at the college. You 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 don't want to be despised on on campus. You don't want to be uh, uh, you know, pariahs. And and um, maybe that had something to do with it. You know, Tom left teaching and. Um, uh, so, didn't have so, to worry about that so anymore. How, but how if you, you wanted to remain uh, in, in teaching, maybe this was going to cause you some problems. Then how do you explain Glenn Lowry? How do you explain John McWhorter? Well, well, uh, I think uh, uh, you guys are, are the exceptions, <laughs> not the rule. <laughs> well, well I, Glenn, I, come on, Glenn, Glenn, you've saw, you've had kind of a on yeah. again, off again I, I relationship with it. movement conservative. Yeah, I, I was yeah. about to confess it. I was about so, to. So add, was John. So I, was, I was John. About, frankly, I was about to add to your. Oh well, I want to hear this about John. I was about to add to the weight of your argument, though, which is that I was so lonely in the mid nineteen, early mid nineteen nineties, and so tired of the ostracism and the contempt and the sneering and the derogation and and the ridicule and and the marginalization. Uh, from my co-racialist academics with whom I was coming into contact on a regular basis, that I probably tacked too far left uh, from my position. Uh, Norman Podhoritz of Commentary Magazine uh, wrote about me once. He says, Lowry has fallen into the loyalty trap. And he was throwing my own arguments back in my face because 10 years before I had published an essay in the public interest in which I said, Beware the loyalty trap. If you're a black intellectual, they think you're only supposed to say certain kind of stuff. And that'll make you less effective at actually contributing to the well-being of your people because you can't tell the truth as you see it. Don't fall into the loyalty trap. I was accused of falling into the same trap. But I've lived long enough to be able to reflect upon those uh, 10, 15 years from 95 to, to 2010. And uh, I've come back to my senses, Jason. <laughs> when I was when I was at Berkeley, which now it's a long time ago, it was 95 to 2002. The reason I left had nothing to do with the shit that I was taking, but <laughs> I had to deal with a lot. You know, people catcalling me as I walked across campus and down Telegraph Avenue, coming up to me when I was in lines at stores and saying nasty little things, calling my office phone. None of these things happened every day, but it was still part of the atmosphere and I know if I had stayed, it would have gotten to the point that when I served on a committee, there was going to be somebody there who didn't like me. There were, you know, there were awards I was almost certainly never going to get because I was in bad odor. And to be honest, I would have withstood that because I'm strange. And a lot of my life when I was at Berkeley was about being a performer at night with people who didn't care about any of these issues. I would have withstood it. But I'm an odd person who doesn't mind that sort of thing, I think, as much as many people do. And at Columbia, I suspect I'm about to undergo a little bit more of that because of you know the way I've gotten louder since last year, once we're all back on campus. And I will withstand it again. But I've got a thick skin. And some people would say too thick a skin in a way. And I don't most people. Yeah, they don't want that. And I completely understand. It doesn't mean that they're not being true to themselves. If right. anything, maybe right. they think harder. But yeah, that's hard. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to be yeah. a pariah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I am, I am really. I, I, I said I'm hopeful that because I see more people than there were out there, you know, t t talking like and writing like like Saul. 
Um, but I am very dispirited at, at the rise of the sort of progressive left and the woke movement and Black Lives Matter and the ascendancy of, of, of people like Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and Nicole Hannah-Jones and Ibram Kendi. Um, I mean, I, I think Tom, um, the idea that, that he is not as well known as them or that his work is not as well known, I, I find just tragic. I mean, it infuriates me. I think he's, he's written circles around these guys. Cornell West, I would include in this group as well. And, and not only just in terms of his, his range, but the, the, the depth and the rigor of Tom's thinking, I don't think they come close to matching. And yet these, these folks are elevated um, uh, as these deep, these deep thinkers on race. And I think that, that um, uh, I, I find that very disturbing that um, we're, 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 this is what passes for, for deep thinking on race today, Nicole Hannah-Jones and Ibram Kendi and ta Coates. And I- Well, and I, the, race, uh, the yeah. race discussion is about feelings. Yeah. It's not yeah. about yeah. thought. And that's what is conditioning the sort of thing that you're talking about. I mean, just for example, if Ibram Kendi had short hair and his name was Anthony Jones, nobody would have any idea who he is. I think that's a very obvious thing. If his name was Anthony Jones, Tony Jones, and he just had short hair, he didn't have the dreadlocks, even with whatever he's done, he nobody would have any idea but but john but john what what what, 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 saying, what i don't what yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that it's feelings you know that's why he's more famous than tom no, I it's more than that it's it's more than that think think, of, think about nicole hannah jones and you, you you sort of get at this in woke racism um where is all this deference to her coming from there there are no shortage of books on on slavery or the us founding oh, she's written none of them and 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 yet, what? Why are are so few historians uh, willing to call her out? What? Why isn't the the head of every history department at every uh, notable institution in this country calling her out? I Jason, think it's cowardice. Afraid. Excuse me. It is intellectual cowardice. Jason, well, they're afraid. We've been calling her out here at the Glenn you, Show for years. You, but you're the exceptions, Not guys. That's, that's my point. We've been pointing out that Ibram X Kendi was an empty suit here. For years. I know, I listen to the I, show. I've been calling for erudition, mastery, deep learning, and a sophisticated intellectual frame from people who write about race for years. Why do you have so I, few fellow travelers? That Why are so few joining you? Th that the, the, the uh, uh, mania behind the Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates phenomenon had a lot more to do with the cultural orientation of white uh, newsroom elites than it had to do with the actual experience, lived experience, as they say, of African Americans. So, so I don't. I, you ask me a question: Why have we got got more people who are fellow travelers? I don't have the answer to the question, but I know where to look for it, and it's not in the black community. It's in the structure of American intellectual and political culture, center and left of center, mm -hmm. in journalism, in the academy, uh, in corporate America. Uh, more broadly. And, and I think there's a general loss of confidence in the virtues of the American project and the American experiment. I mean, I, I, you know, how can Colin Kaepernick have defenders, you know, in, including you, John? <laughs> oh, in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I understood where he was coming from. But I, I, as an, I said athlete, to you an athlete, let me say this representing the United States of America on a global stage who thinks that holding their fist up is an appropriate uh, gesture, is a dignified act of virtue, is a moral stand, is, is a coward and a fool. Okay. Well, are you afraid yeah. of No, no, it's playing into a trope. It's, it's playing into a... Well, Glenn, Glenn let, me, let me ask Jason, you this. Do you think it's so bad? I mean, yeah, Nicole, Hannah Jones, et cetera, they get these certain prizes. But do you feel like Coleman Hughes is obscure compared to them? Coleman is about to do oh, yes. Ted, yes. I happen to know. Yeah, I do. You, in comparison, sorry, he's about to do what? He's about to do Ted. He's being embraced by all the proper places. I don't feel like Glenn and me are so deeply uh, obscure. It's not you about know, we're not going to get it's those not about prizes. Us and, more, and more power to Coleman. I'm talking about yeah. the heartbeat of the culture. 
I'm, well, I'm, I'm talking about, about major culture. institutions. I'm talking about the MacArthur Foundation. I'm talking about the Pulitzer right. Committee. Why are they I'm talking the about the faculty of the Columbia School of Journalism? I'm talking about the right. newsroom at the right. New York Times. I'm talking about the people who, who publish your pieces at the Atlantic. All of those places are politically. I'm talking saturated. about the Democratic Party. I'm talking about the White House. I'm talking about Barack and Michelle Obama. I'm talking about yeah. Netflix. I'm talking yeah. about Amazon and YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glenn, you mentioned in passing that that in, in, in the late 1980s, Randall Kennedy had written this critique of critical race theory, appeared in the Harvard Law Review, named names, took them down, basically said, this is a glorified argument for affirmative action. That's all this is. In fact, the, 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 the academics at Harvard who, 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 who or the people he sent the piece out to to look at before it was published, urged him not to publish it because they said it'll hurt their chances of pushing for more affirmative action. I mean, they were very upfront about this. Kennedy wrote it anyways. Why aren't there more left-wing critiques of the progressives today? I mean, where, why is it left to people who are more right of center to do this? I, what, am, I, am I imagining things or was there a time I think when the left guy. did a better job of policing its own? Oh, I, I see. think I think, yeah, you know, you think of George Orwell or somebody like that. And I think there's there's uh, Adolf Reed uh, Emeritus now, the University of Pennsylvania a political scientist who I just saw interviewed by Matt Taibbi on one of these podcasts where he was offering a left of center critique yeah. of the careerist interests of the race mongers who are yeah. getting paid and who are getting a lot of cachet out of what they do. They have a shtick. They have a performative uh, dimension on, on uh, race mongering. Reed wants to say, no, it's not race, it's class. And if you paid attention to the structure of pro profit, production, corporate power, money, finance, uh, if, you were, if you had a real labor movement and whatnot, you, you'd have a different uh, uh, you know, politics. He's a Bernie Sanders guy. He's a democratic socialist. This is Adolf Reed. But he is a man of the left who has been openly critical of of uh, of the race of the Brit time Britain, of the world. Britain is better at having that left. I'm thinking over there. There are more people who are left of center who are criticizing the people who are left, left, left of center. It doesn't happen as much here, I suspect. And I'm just flying blind here because maybe in Britain until maybe recently, they were a little bit less afraid of being called racist. I think in the culture, it has not been as deeply inculcated. So if you're liberal but not hard left you're so afraid of being called a racist and especially with social media but even before that you're probably just going to keep quiet and buy your groceries there's maybe a little bit less of a muzzle lately since about last summer now there is but before that in other places there was a little bit less of that sense of a muzzle but yeah you're right jason if you're talking about critique from the left not much no you're mm -hmm. right guys i i hate to do this because we should be talking on for another hour we didn't talk about migration and culture. We didn't talk about affirmative action, a worldwide disaster. That was uh, my favorite. Th th there's a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about. I wanted to find out what Tom Sowell had to say about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when it was being debated uh, in the U.S. Congress in 1963, 1964, uh, because, you know, uh, Tom is a, is a classical liberal in his orientation. Civil Rights Act of 64 is meant to fight discrimination, but it also has titles in it about public accommodation and so forth that a lot of reasonable people might think infringe upon liberty in ways that are, are, that are problematic or at least require you to think about it for a minute. So uh, I was wondering, I don't know, you want to answer that, Jason? What was Tom's position sure, sure. on the Civil Rights Act of 64? I, I, he, he supported it and the Voting Rights Act as well. He also supported Brown. Um, he, where he parted ways, uh, he didn't think that these bills uh, were going to be the sil silver bullet that a lot of blacks thought they were. That, and that's they, and he, they weren't. And they weren't. Yeah, it's one of the many ways. Just like you mentioned affirmative action, he, he, he said, you guys are barking up the wrong tree here. This is not what what uh, uh, the black poor needs. Um, this is this is the, you're, you're getting away from the from the sort of development of that human capital. That is what is going to be necessary. Focusing yeah. on black blacks need to focus internally. On, on, on their issues. This is not about getting getting special favors or gaining more political clout. And that's the direction that the civil rights movement went, particularly in the post-65 Voting Rights Act era. And that is where Tom really started to, 
to part ways. And then, of course, you get into the militant separatism and all that, which he didn't he didn't particularly care for. But he never thought he supported the the, the civil rights acts, but he didn't think that they would be uh, the, the the silver bullet. And he said so at the time um, uh, that this is the, 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 the problems of blacks, he put it to paraphrase them or something, uh, um, uh, amount to more than what white people are doing to them. And, 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 and that was where he was, where he came down on those, on those issues. But he did, he did support them. He said, he said they, they made the, 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 the country more just for everyone. Uh, they, were, they were a step in the right direction. But, uh, but, but in terms of inequality and, and, and so forth, um, much more was going to be needed. I'm glad I gave you a chance to add that addendum to our discussion here with Thomas Sowell, your book, Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell, Jason Riley, Wall Street Journal, and Manhattan Institute. Thank Thanks you. for coming on The Glenn Show. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jason. You guys take care. Take care.